Okay, so real quick, I want to do a video going over the introduction to set logic. I don't have a whole lot to preface this topic, so let's just go ahead and hop on in. Okay. So, just a very, very basic introduction to sets, and what is a set? So, set is essentially something that plays a critical role in many areas of mathematics, including our very own discrete math that we're going over right now. And simply put, it's just a way to categorize various elements in a single standard object, or just a collection of objects. That's how you want to view it that way. Now, everything inside of a set is referred to as an element. These elements can be anything. What we're going to be seeing them over the course of this uh, video is going to be numbers, basically integers specifically. So that would be one, six, 12, 15, and so forth. It could be letters, it could be S, it could be A, R, could be shapes, colors, animals, anything. Anything that you can group together, you can make a set of. Now, sets are going to be defined by indicating what elements belong to them. So we have maybe set A and set B, set C, that all going to have various elements within them and we just need to define what belongs to these sets. So we have different types of notations. One example is this going to be roster notation. The roster notation of the set is a list of the elements enclosed in curly braces with the individual elements celebrated by commas. The order of these elements is not important. So if we take a look, we have set A wrapped in curly braces. We have 2, 4, 6, and 10 all separated commas. This indicates that set A contains the elements 2, 4, 6, and 10, and the order of these elements is irrelevant. So we had A equals 4, 6, 2, 10 be the same thing. If we had 10, 2, 6, 4, it'd also be the same thing. Now real quick, I will go ahead and say I will draw out some of these. I'm terrible at writing curly braces. Just gonna go ahead and get that out of the way. But anyway, moving on. For sets, we have two very critical aspects very early on. One, well, that's the elements. We already kind of touched on those. We have ways of telling what is an element in the set and what's not an element in the set. And we have cardinality. I'll touch on that one in just a second. So looking at the elements, we have two different symbols. We have this one, that kind of looks like a weird E. Another one looks the same symbol, but with a line through it. So the first one is used to indicate that cell element is in a set. So we have two is an element within set A. The next one we have that same E in a way with a slash through it indicates an element is not in a set. So we have five is not an element of set A. Now, the cardinality of a set A is noted by what looks like absolute value bars. It is not the absolute value, I promise. It is just the same symbol, same notation. But it is used to determine the number of elements within a set. So in this case, we have that same 2, 4, 6, 10, then the cardinality of set A is 4. There's four elements inside of it. And then we have two very special types of sets, that being the empty set and a universal set. The empty set is noted like this with a circle with a slash through it. That is the empty set, also known as a null set. It contains no elements. But the cardinality of an empty set, like this, it's always going to be zero. And then universal set is basically indicated by this kind of U. It's a set that contains all elements mentioned in a particular context. So we've seen this previously in propositional logic in the form of a domain. So examples of that would be all real numbers, all positive integers, all multiples of six, so on and so forth. Anything that you could constitute as saying these are all the potential elements that we can use. Now, I mentioned propositional logic in terms of domain, and I mentioned that because everything in set logic is built off propositional logic. But I'll get explained more in the next video, but these two particular sets tie in very, very closely. So just keep that in mind. Now, we have also two more types of sets. That is going to be finite and infinite sets. Finite, very straightforward. It is something 
with the elements we can count. So find a set, a set that is either empty or whose elements can be numbered one through n for some positive integer n. So the empty set would not be finite because there are no elements. And then obviously an infinite set would not be. So our one, two, three, four here is a finite set. Infinite set, any set that is not finite, it's pretty straightforward. You're usually gonna see these in the form of a universal set. Here we have universal set is all positive integers. Now, on the topic of infinite sets, we have very large sets. These don't have to be infinite. These could just be something that is, well, for lack of better words, very large. So maybe you have a trillion elements in it. That's not infinite, but it is a incomprehensibly large number. And we need to find some way to denote that. Now, typically when we categorize elements, in a set, there's going to be some pattern, going to be some way that we can demonstrate the data set that we have without having to list everything in it. And we have two very, very good examples down here. But we can fill in all the missing elements using ellipses. And you'll see how we do that right quick. So we have set B that is one, three, five, ellipses, 99. So essentially, this is all odd integers between 0 and 100. If we look at this, we have 1, 3, 5 is going to be repeating. It's counting odd integers. We start at 1, we end at 99. We can say that these are all the odd integers between 0 and 100. Since we have a number on this far right side right here after the ellipses, that indicates that this is not an infinite set. It's just something that's very large. Meanwhile, for C, we have 3, 6, 9, 12 ellipses. There is no element after the ellipses. That indicates this is an infinite set. Specifically, we have all positive multiples of three infinite because there is no end. And then moving on, we have a very, very important part of sets being subsets. This is just going to be the very basic style of subset. So if every element in A is also an element of B, then we can say that A is a subset of B, denoted such as this. So A kind of sideways U with the bar under it, B. Whereas if there is an element of A that is not an element of B, then we can say that A is not a subset of B, and denoted as A, same symbol with the slash to it, B. Now, if the universal set is U, then for every set A, the empty set is a subset of A, and A is a subset of the universal set, or U. And a good example of this would be, say we have, again, I'm very, very bad at drawing the um, curly braces on my tablet, so I, I apologize. this uh do not use three two four six and then the universe set maybe um positive even integers so this is the universal set positive even integers 246, if I were to create a set from that, would be a subset of my overall universal set. And then the empty set is always a subset of any set. So this would kind of that relationship, how that works. Now moving on, we have two very special types of subsets, or specifically every set relationship that is a subset would have to be one of these two. Now, if A is a subset of B, and there is an element of B that is not an element of A, as in A is not equal to B, then A is considered a proper subset of B. And it's noted A is just sideways U of B, and there is no bar under it. That indicates that A is going to be a proper subset of B. Specifically, if we do a Venn diagram of this, 
we have in the outside. Okay. We want maybe elements one, two, and three. Maybe we just enclose two and three and call that subset A. So A equals two, three. And I did the thing I'm not supposed to of using three because it can get kind of hard to distinguish the uh, curly braces. B is going to be one, two, three. Okay. So elements of A are two and three. Elements of B are one, two, and three. So by having this set up, we can determine that there are elements in set B that do not exist in set A, which is this one. Therefore, A is a subset of B. So yes, A is a subset of B. But more specifically, A is a proper subset of B. This is not C. This is just a sideways U. Now, if we change it, this one doesn't exist. Then A is 2, 3. B is 2, 3. A is no longer a proper subset of B. Because two sets are considered equal if and only if each subset has a subset of the other, which we note as A equals B. So A equals B if and only if A is a subset of B, B is a subset of A. We can look at this, both are 2 and 3. The elements of A exist in elements exist in set B, and the elements of B exist inside set A. Therefore, A is a subset of B, B is a subset of A, therefore A equals B. So if two sets are equal to each other, neither can be a proper subset of the other one. And if something is a proper subset of another set, it is impossible for them to be set equal. So if you have a subset, you can guarantee that it's either a proper subset or it is set equal. Or specifically, it, you have a proper subset in some way. So A could be proper subset B. B wouldn't be a proper subset of A, but it would have a proper subset. Just to specify. Okay. So, dictate that a little bit better on the three relationships that we have with Venn diagrams. And on the left side, we have the set A of 1, 2, 3, 4. Set B of 2, 4. We can dictate that B is a subset of A. Indicated here in the Venn diagram. 3 is an element of A. So, 3 is not an element of B though. Therefore, set B is a proper subset of set A. It exists completely within set A but there are elements in set A that do not exist inside set B. Whereas in the middle here, we have set A is 1, 2, 3, 4. C is 2, 4, 5. So, 5 is an element of C. Remember that right there. 5 is not an element of A. So there is an element in set C that does not exist in set A. Therefore, C is not a subset of A and A is not a subset of C as well. So this is what happens whenever you have two sets that just neither is a subset of either one. And then lastly, we have A is 1, 2, 3, 4. D is 1, 2, 3, 4. A is a subset of D. D is a subset of A. And that means that A must equal D. So in this last example, both are subsets of each other. Since there are no elements outside either one that exist in the other one, like so, with one three existing outside of B, neither of these can ever be proper subsets. Now, moving on, we have the concept of set of sets. So it's possible that the elements of a set in themselves are sets themselves. Now, what that means is if we take a look at set A here. We have the overall roster notation of 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3. And you might look at this and think, okay, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 elements. That would not be the case for set A. If you wanted to count the elements, you'd count these sets 
as individual elements. You more have one, two, three, four elements inside of it. You look at the Venn diagram, we have one, two, we have one, we have one, two, three, and we have two. And by themselves. Now, these are all the individual elements here. One, two is this element of A, one is element of A, two is element of A, and one, two, three is an element of A. And for the cardinality of A, doing four not seven and then we can denote a new subset of this kind of purple box here of one two and one and this new set that we made would be a proper subset of a so just because we have a set of sets doesn't mean that the individual elements exist outside of the original set it's just that they count as one element so if we take a look at this new one here, then its cardinality would be two, because the one and the two are still going to be counted as an individual element. Moving on, lastly, we have power sets. I actually really like power sets, I think they're pretty cool. So, I'll probably stay on this for just a little bit. The power set of A, denoted E of A, is a set of all subsets of A. So basically, we have set A has elements 1, 2, 3. And what the power set is, is every single possible subset you can create from the original set. Now, keep in mind that we are in Rossin rotation. So when you have this 1, 2 here, 2, 1 would not count because the order doesn't matter. They would be the same thing. Same thing if we did 3, 1, 3, 2, or something like 3, 2, 1, or 2, 1, 3, so on and so forth. They're all the same thing because Rosh notation. So, if we look at all the potential subsets of this set right here, and we end up with empty set because it is a subset of all sets. The individual elements 1, 2, and 3 are individual, well, not individual, but the two pairs. 1, 2, 1, 3, and 2, 3, so everything has 2. And then our 3, which is 1, 2, 3. So 0 individuals, 2 elements, and 1, 3 elements. Now, with that being said, that constitutes every possible subset we can have. There's a really easy way to determine the cardinality of a power set. And that is 2 raised to the power of the cardinality of the original set. To take a look at this, the set A, we want to derive a variable n from it. So we end up with cardinality A equals 3 or n equals 3. Okay, so the cardinality of the power set is going to be 2 to the n. So we end up with 2 and 3, which equals 8. And we count it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Now, if we had some, say, like, that B is equal to, I don't know, 8, 12, uh, 1, 6, 5, then remember, we have a set of sets, so that's going to be 1, 2, Three, four. So the cardinality of B is four. If we cardinality, the power set of B is going to be two to the four or sixteen. Now, one thing that I want to touch on real quick because this is one of the more interesting concepts to me is what happens when we have this set I mean, uh sure this well this is an empty set which is the same thing as this from earlier and recall that if we do the cardinality of the empty set we get zero so what happens when we do a power set 
of the empty set, more specifically, the cardinality of the power set of the empty set. Well, call it 2, or now the original set, 2 to the 0, which equals 1. But how does this work? There's no elements, so we don't really have anything. But recall that in our example of here, power set of A, the empty set exists because it's a subset of all sets. So the absence of anything is still something at the end of the day. So if we do strictly just list out all the possible results we can have of subsets, then the only thing we can get is an empty set, which is why this is one. So that's kind of how power sets work. And that is just pretty much the end of what I have for the introduction. So again, there's not a whole lot of complexity happening with set logic, at least not right now, just because it's kind of laying the foundation for how sets works and all the different various aspects of say like cardinality, finite infinite sets, the idea of the empty set and universal set. So not a whole lot of uniqueness going on. But what is more interesting will be in the next video when we start doing set logic operations and tying it back to propositional logic. So hopefully that gets a little more interesting and I usually enjoy it and it ties into genuine computer science stuff like database management systems and stuff like that. So with all being said, I hope you learned something and I'll see you guys in the next video.